Good evening to all of you here at Nordia House and to all of you joining tonight's lecture online. I'm Sarah Bourne with the Nordic Northwest Friday Night Lecture Committee. Welcome to tonight's lecture, Norway's Path to Winter Sports Success. Norway's success in winning Olympic medals continues to amaze sports enthusiasts. Coaches, trainers, and athletes from around the world are increasingly curious and travel to Norway to find out more. Tim Gibbons, our speaker tonight, shares with us what some describe as Norway's winning secrets. Tim, a native Oregonian, lives in Bend. His impressive sports bio makes him an expert in these secrets. He is a graduate of the University of Oregon and has a master's degree in exercise science from Northern Michigan University. His background includes being a cross-country ski coach at the College of Idaho, Middlebury College, Dartmouth College, Mount Bachelor's Sports Education Foundation, and Redmond High School. He has been a sports physiologist with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, tested athletes from 22 Olympic sports, and provided training recommendations to athletes and coaches. As an endurance training coordinator with his committee, Tim traveled extensively in North America and in Europe, documenting the de developmental stages, processes, and systems of endurance athletes capable of achieving international competitive excellence. You are joining us this evening to hear from Tim. So, Tim, the microphone is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a homecoming. I grew up in Raleigh Hills and went to um, St. Helens Hall Bishop Daigle, now called Oregon Episcopal. Went to Raleigh uh, Hills Elementary, Whitford, just down the road, and graduated Beaverton. Um, but I'm also... Um, Homecoming, because in 2016, I was curator for um, a ski exhibit, Winter Comes, Oregon's Nordic Ski History, that was uh, displayed here. So it's nice to be back um, and see so many, and see some friendly faces. Um, and I'm wearing the, the appropriate gear, a Norwegian sweater. So um, what I want to, and so I've spent some time in, in the summer and winter in Norway and talking to athletes, coaches, physicians. So I have some personal experience that I can relate, but also some of the research that I did for the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So currently five and a half million people. Oregon is currently 4.2 million. Um, and so it is, Norway is the most successful Olympic winter sport nation. So 405 medals. Um, and you can see the medals at the 2018 and then 37, I believe, at, it, at last year at Beijing. Um, next slide. So they're pretty heavy in some of the ski sports, especially biathlon. But take a look. They're, they're across a lot of different events. So snowboarding, ski jumping, speed skating, freestyle, curling. Um, yeah, it's a pretty wide variety of of events that they're, they're doing well. Next. So a brief <laughs> ancient history. So that's a photo, uh, that's a drawing of a moose that's on a ski tip and that, that ski was carbon dated to 8,300 years old. So skiing predates the wheel by 3,500 years. So understand that skiing <laughs> was very important for anyone in the northern latitudes or very southern latitudes, you know. And so um, I love that slide. And so that was part of the ski, hist ski history exhibit that was here seven years ago. But I love that because someone took the time to intricately carve a moose on the backside of a ski tip. Next, next slide. Um, in the mid 12th century, up until about uh, 1215, Norway was, you know, in a civil war. And so you had the Birkebeiners, and that actually was a pejorative term. And they were against the Baglers, which was aligned with the clergy, the church. And, and Birkebeiner meant you were so poor that you needed to use birch bark to wrap around your shoes and around your lower legs when you were skiing. Today, it's a very different term. It means strength and endurance. Um, so these two skiers, Torsten Skevla and Shervold Skruka, um, carried the baby prince Hawken Hawkinson um, seven days to the royal palace in Nagaros. 
the king had had a baby uh, out of out of wedlock. It was Inga of Varteg that was the mother of the baby prince. And so um, during this civil war, the Birkebeiners realized there is an heir that that can be that we can use to in, in part of in, to leverage our war. Um, he became king in 1217 when he was 14 years old, and it ushered in what Norway calls the Golden Age. Um, next slide, please. So in 1932, Norway started the Birkebeiner Rennet, the Birkebeiner ski race. And so you ski from Reina over the mountains to Lillehammer, and of course, Lillehammer was 1994 Olympic Winter Games. But you, they weigh the, your pack. So you have a fanny pack or a backpack. It has to weigh three and a half kilograms, what they believe the weight of the baby prince was at the time. So, so you get to the start line, and they're, <laughs> they're very official about weighing the pack. And if you don't have enough, then they'll give you weight to put in it. So basically, you're putting you know, food, water, and other things that can weigh that um, make that three and a half kilograms. So 17,000 ski racers. The oldest start first. So my dad, when he was 66, did it. He was one of the first to start. If you're an Olympic or world champion, you're behind the elders. You have to pass the older people during the race. Um, it, it's a wonderful tradition. Next slide, please. So one of the most famous Norwegian explorers is Fridhof Nansen. Um, and he skied across Greenland, the first to do so in 1888. I love this quote, but I love the whole quote, but I'll just say the last sentence. Oh, this must be maintained, and cross-country skiing must develop and thrive as long as there are men and women in Norwegian valleys. His wife, in the photo there, was uh, an opera singer sung throughout um, Europe. Um, so he was given a hero's welcome when he returned after skiing across Greenland. I mean, it was just... The town of Oslo went crazy because he was he had done this done this endurance event across Greenland. Next slide. So one of the big races, and it happens usually second or third week in March, is the Holman Colon, and that's just up above um, in, in the mountains above Oslo. You can see that it's kind of hazy, and that's because of the smoke, and you can see some teepees. So people camp out for two days, because there's two races. There's a 30 kilometer for women and a 50 kilometer for men. This year, for the first time, women are doing the same distances as men. So women will do the 50 kilometer, 31 miles. Next slide. Um, so there's 150,000 spectators along the course. So you have maybe about 20,000 in the stadium, <laughs> and the additional is out. So it is a party. There are sometimes eight or ten people deep along the ski trail. It is a party for two days, um, and the, the racers have to go through the campfire smoke. Um, not always the best. Next. So I'm just going to show you of maybe about eight or ten slides of some of the best Norwegian athletes. Some current. He is one of the best in the world right now in downhill. He won the Hanenkam just a couple weeks ago, January 22nd. Um, and I'll show you a video, um, 2020, 2020 overall World Cup. Here is a video of him at the Hanenkam, which is in Kitzbühel, Austria. He was 16th, almost crashed, had to save it, and now here he is trying to bounce back and also dealing with that right hand that can affect him at the start, pushing out of the gate. Worst performance, but his greatest recovery. Now, every, three of the four victories he's had this year, it's through the power of his start. It's so steep here, as he said, it's not as critical. It's the least critical start on all the World Cup. So he's the got that going for him. And the way he skied for, yesterday, it, without that mistake, there's no question he was among the best, maybe one, the best. Almost. Quick work of the early, yes, and he is on his way. So building on his time, growing into the run. With the near crash in the first downhill, Pino, Kilda did admit afterwards that it got him rattled, and he was a little scared. How much does that come into the psychology of his approach today, do you think? It just proves that he is clinically sane. <laughs> I mean, the moment that he had there was 
horrifying, but he pulled it off. And what he said is, I can't go into the traverse quite as hot as I did yesterday. And so we'll see if he bleeds a little speed off. He's got the lead right now, a little bit of a feather. Get the alignment. And this is looking good. This is looking good to eclipse the time of Johan Clary dashing his chances. Taking aim at his fifth win of the season. No one's done that in the last 20 years. Going for back-to-back -back wins the last two years, and he's got the lead again here in Kitchbuehl. Killed a sensational at the Haunted Cup. So that's Alexander Omad Kilda. Um, Uli Einer Bjorndalen, so his nickname was The King, and he's retired. Um, but you can see his accomplishments, 12 Olympic medals, 45 World Championship medals, six overall World Cup titles, um, you know, 179 World Cup podiums, 95 World Cup wins. Um, he, <laughs> so <clears throat> if you don't know, biathlon is cross running skiing and rifle marksmanship. They'll pull up to a range that's 50 meters away. Um, you're shooting prone, it's about the size of a silver dollar. Uh, if you're doing standing, it's about the size of a, of a saucer underneath a cup, a coffee cup. Um, so he was a phenomenal uh, shooter to watch. He would just, um, he was almost robotic, but he was, he's such a beautiful skier. Next slide, please. Another biathlete um, is Ingra Tandervald. Um, six world championship medals and a number of World Cup wins and World Cup podiums. She's still competing today. Next. And one of the best is Tyrell Ekhoff, um, eight Olympic medals, 15 world champs. Um, you can see that she's done almost 300 World Cup races. Um, she's still competing today. Next. Um, move into snowboard, and Celia Norendahl does slope style or big air, if you've watched the last couple Olympics. Um, so she's several World Championship medals, and then Winter X Games and Winter X Games Europe champion. Warren Lundby, ski champion. Um, you can see, you know, 100, almost 150 World Cup starts, Olympic gold medal, a gold medal, and eight World Championship medals. So one of the best who recently retired, she retired last year and is currently expecting her first child, uh, Teresa Yohog. Um, four Olympic gold medals, 10 world champs, um, and three overall World Cup titles. She was, uh, she was phenomenal to watch. Next. Um, this is Johannes Hosvat Klebo, or Klebo. He is currently competing and still one of the best in the world. Um, you, can, you can buy a, a subscription from U.S. Ski and Snowboard. I figured it's $10, $12 a month or something. But I, I do it on the cheap, and I just go to YouTube. And about seven, eight hours after World Cup race is finished, you can watch it for free. Um, <laughs> you, you have to, like, not look at results if you want to look at it, you know, fresh. Next. So the queen um, is Marit Bjorgen, and she retired um, after uh, 2018, I think 2018 Olympic Winter Games but 15 Olympic medals more than any other winter athlete across all nations. And here is a video of her competing. Um, this is a, a sprint race in um, Toblock, Italy, in northern Italy, up in the Dolomites. You'll see her emerge. On the far right is Keegan Randall, a U.S. athlete. So it's about 1.2 1 1 kilometers in length, so they're literally going all out for that distance. Marit always had a way of, of getting to line just <laughs> before the others. So 
mid 19th century to right before the Norwegian constitution, their independence, um, there were three cultural themes that converged. One was Nor Norwegian mythology, it was kind of resurgence, and then skiing popularizes sport, and then Idrit, living a healthy lifestyle. I'm gonna go through those in a little more detail in the next slides. So Poetic Edda was written in Iceland in 1270. Prose Edda was written in 1220. The Poetic Edda are what we consider the Norwegian myths. So that's the Odin, Ullr, Skadi, um, Freya, um, and those are, and so for some reason, that literature became popular again in the mid 19th century. At about the same time, next slide, you had someone named Sandra Norheim. He's pictured on the left at the bottom there. So skiing went from a very utilitarian activity, hunting and transportation, to it became a sport. It had never really been a sport. There had been Finnish ski troops in the late 18th century, but never something that there was competition. So he was the first one to really demonstrate a telemark turn. You can see kind of a modern skier demonstrating the telemark turn. But he also invented a ski biting using birch roots. So birch trees are kind of a popular thing. Next slide. So Idrit is a very 19th century definition that you, you know, a healthy lifestyle close to nature. What Norwegian Jews now is free loose live. And so it's really that open air life that you're really outdoors and you're doing something um, some outdoor activity and you're close to nature. Um, and you can see that, next slide, Norwegians live a healthy lifestyle. So families and, uh, are always out. So I've been there um, in the winter and the summer and I can attest that there's, <laughs> families are exercising all the time. Next. So If, if I looked across the world and looked at the best youth sports model, it's Norway. And I'll tell you why. One, it's nonprofit. Uh, they have a vast majority of the kids and the literature that I pulled up, 93% of children play sports. Um, some are no cost and some are low cost. If a family cannot afford, there is financial aid available or they just waive the fee for that, for that family. Um, there are no travel teams formed. Um, um, until age 13, and there's no ranking. So in the U.S., we put a lot of emphasis on uh, a parent, a friend of mine, had a 10-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl, and from Ben, their tournament, soccer tournaments took one to Eugene and one to Portland, so the <laughs> husband and wife were split. And he's like, why are we doing this again? Um, so uh, you can see <laughs> those kids are probably having a lot of fun. Next, next slide. So some of the research that I pulled up, you, you can look at the motives for participation. Um, it included f Finnish kids and also Swedish, but also Norwegian. But as you would probably expect, having fun is at the very top, improving health, but then it's about being with friends and meeting new friends. The Norge Idrits Forbund, or what we would say the Norwegian Confederation of Sport, published this document, the children's rights in sport. The ones that are underlined, the second, third, and fourth, I'm gonna cover a little more in depth, but children have a right to, that training and competition is, is safe. Um, they have the freedom to choose which sport they want to do. Um, they can do any competition or no competition at all, whatever they choose, and Training and competition is age appropriate. So we know that a 10-year-old, probably a boy or girl before puberty, is very different than a 16, 17-year-old after adolescence and puberty. And so you, training has to be adjusted for that. Next. So I'm going to read it. Basically, it's children have the right to participate in training and competition activities, which are designed to help develop friendship and solidarity amongst them. So up to about age 12 or 13, this is one of the best, most, the thing that is most emphasized. Next. Children have the right to experience the feelings of competency and to learn a varied skill set. It's all about participating in a wide variety of sports. Um, next. Children have the right to express their own opinions and their opinions should be considered. Children have the opportunity 
to participate in planning sessions and can execute their own ideas and sports activities with their coaches and parents. So you see that they put a lot of emphasis on that the kids are having fun, they have some influence. Um, it's a very, uh, so it's a very different environment that we might see here in, in, in the U.S. and maybe some other countries. I took the long-term athlete development model from Canada, Canada Sport for Life, because it very closely mimics what happens in Norway. And you can see from the first three stages, the active start fundamentals and learning to train, that it's really about multi-sport participation. It's about physical literacy, that there's basic sports skills are, are happening. That's what physical literacy means. And that there's really developing a love of sport and activity. Next. In the next couple stages, um, so the age-appropriate training competition, but the sensitive training periods. We know at age 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, if training happens at that time, you can have almost an uh, the adaptation is accentuated so that you're actually putting yourself in a, in a better sp spot as an athlete. What you, if you talk to a college coach or an NFL coach and you say, do you want a child who's played football, only football from five years old until they were in college? And the coach will go, no, I want an athlete. And that's what Norway does. They're providing children with lots of opportunity to participate in a wide variety of sports so they can become an athlete and have that physical literacy. Next slide. So money comes from the federal government in Norway <laughs> to fund facilities and fund sport organizations. Because when, and they have, um, you can see basically that the, the state or the, is, is the NIF is that Norwegian Sport Federation. And you can see maybe at a county level and the city level um, that they have a very distinct structure um, and how money is funneled and where, where support is given. Next slide. 12,000 clubs in Norway, sport clubs. So that's summer and winter sports. Um, so you have that public authority, you have federal money helping with facilities and helping with the sport organizations. But what I think is most important is that they're, they're stating policy from a federal level to make sure that it's safe, that the best practices of athlete development, the best practices of sports science are being administered, executed. So it's in the Ministry of Culture Affairs where they, where they start with direct the sport policy. So the Norgay Idris Forbun includes all sports. So that can be professional, amateur, young, old, able-bodied, disabled. And so, you know, the four-year-old boy or girl and the Olympic champion are all part of under that. With eight universities and five and a million people, they have a lot of highly educated coaches. Most are volunteer, um, and maybe some are very low paid, but it's it's in addition to maybe the job they're already doing because, um, but they're receiving very good education of how to coach so they understand how to coach a four, a five-year-old versus a 15-year-old. Next. So one of the things that they make sure is that that child has had that great, wonderful experience growing up. Um, and when they do specialize, it's in their mid to late teens. So it's probably 16 to age 20 is when someone is participating in one sport year-round, and that's what a specialization means. When they do that, there's an immense amount of resources available to them from their club, from their regional level, and from the federal level. So if they start to rise up in the, in the ranks, um, they have financial sports, sports science, medical, and academic help. So I wanted to throw this out there just so you understand. This is Three years ago, his income was 1.2 million in, in U.S. dollars. So he's receiving it from the national team, their stipend, from prize winnings, um, from sponsors, and businesses that he and his partners created. So there's a way that while it, you know, if you look at our professional sports, the attention is paid for those highly paid multi-million dollar, but the average NFL player, 
is not making a million dollars. They're making probably close to $400,000 a year. Um, so Claybo is doing all right. They also have a lot of money to spend on their national team. So if you look at the cross-country team and biathlon team, um, budgets are 10 times that of U.S. And so this is an information I got from our U.S. coaches and in talking with Norwegian coaches. Um, if you looked at this current season, Norway named 96 national team members to their cross-country team. The U.S. has 22. If someone gets sick in Norway, you just bring the next person up. There's no, <laughs> there's no difference in, in quality. It's like, I think, last slide then. So, Haya Norge, which is what they yell when you're on, when you're on, the, on the ski course or alongside the, the ski course. So, thank you. And um, I guess we're going to have a little Q&A afterwards. Yeah. If you'll uh, raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone around so everyone, including those that are online, will hear the questions. Any questions? Here's one, Bob. I'll hold it. How do the other Nordic countries compare in terms of opportunities for kids and, and their sports programs compared to Norway? Um, I think, especially Sweden and Finland, you're going to see very similar kinds of experiences. Um, you, you've got a lot of <laughs> uh, travel and crossover with those nations and, you know, information from coaches and um, th 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 there's a healthy respect for um, adhering to good athlete development and, and good sports and use of sports science, the best practices. Um, I, you would see that also in Central Europe. You'll see that, um, that they'll follow the, the multi-sport participation, that kids need to just be participating and develop good skills. You'll see that in Austria, Germany, France. It, nor Italy, Northern Italy. Two, two questions. Um, are there any stories of blood doping in the past valid? And another question is, is there any future in telemark racing? <laughs> are you referring to blood doping within Norway or when, within the sport, within ski sport? You know, I don't know of the most recent athletes that I would say that they're very clean. There is a very, um, there's a health of respect for, for competing clean. Um, as far as telemark racing, yeah, you just have to show the excitement and get people excited. I, I, I think it's going to stay where it has been. I know it's, it's been improved. Uh, one of my friends and neighbors, uh, Terry Shershaw, competed in Telemark and uh, racing uh, back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about... Um the coaches and how they're trained and they're volunteered and is there a certificate or how does that work? So they can attend, uh, you know, the universities um, to get their PE or a sports science degree. Um, but there is a coaching level, um, different levels. So an entry level and, and there's about four levels, I think. Um, and they'll, they'll get, you know, a diploma after each one, but basically they understand, you know, training techniques, psychology, waxing, um, all the things that make up maybe ski sport um, is a sport that I coached. Um, in the U.S., we've done a better job of doing that, but it's, um, it's for... It's usually for someone who's, what I love about Norway is that it's the volunteers that are part of it. So they're part of that local sport club within their town, 
and they've gone and gotten the certification from Coach's Education, so that they, so that yeah, they're getting, they're getting. Norway is a leader <laughs> in sports science research, so they're getting the best information from the universities down to those sport clubs. Well, that's a great segue into my question. Um, in 2009, Oregon implemented the, the nation's first uh, youth return to sport, return to play law with regard to concussed uh, athletes. And in one of your slides, the Norwegian Confederation said that safety is the number one priority uh, for the young athletes. And I'm wondering if you know anything about the state of their return to play protocols with regard to concussed athletes. I'm sorry, I don't. Um, yeah, I would, I would just have to assume that they, they're doing something, yeah, on the, on the leading edge of that, of that topic. J just knowing who they are and wh what they want to do. How do they select the 16, 17 year old to become a one athlete or one event person? And does that young person get a stipend for all of their training? And So it's still up to the child, it's still up to that 16 or 17 to choose if they want to. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah to, be, to be the best in the world, you need to have a fire burning pretty deep inside to, to do the, the hours of training that is required to be successful. So um, they're getting support from their local club, and then as they rise up, and, and you know, if, if that person is competing internationally, then, yeah, then they're getting support maybe from a regional level and, um, yeah, the federal level. But, but it's, it's mainly in terms of they're getting, um, Support at camps so that person may may be going to you know ski on snow in Europe in, in the summer um, You know those kinds of things, so it's not it's not costing that family and that child that money yeah. Yeah, What advice would you give for a grandparent training a five-year-old girl to enjoy winter sports and not expect it to be in the Olympics Find some friends who, and, and, and other parents who have the same goals. Yeah, it's much more fun to be in a group that, that you're having fun together. Um, and, you know, you saw that fun and, fun and friendship were a huge part of, especially 13 and under. And that's where developing motor skills, developing athletic skills, that, and have, have your granddaughter play lots of different sports. Um, and then at, at, when they want to, they can pick what they want to do. Yeah, but they'll have that physical literacy that, yeah. I, I would try to find other girls the same age. There are other boys that maybe they're just, it's a fun group to be around. Okay. Um, so first of all, I, I grew up in Norway in that system, so I, I, I applaud your, your um, presentation. One question, now you're seeing Norwegians are competing. They have the Ironman champion. They have the Olympic triathlete, triathlon champion. 400 meter hurdles. They have the 400 meter hurdles, the mile, the 1500 meters. You mentioned a little bit about sports science um, and how they are sort of doing things there. Anything you, anything additional you could sort of say about that and how they're they're developing that? Being the use of sports science. Um, for, for someone maybe who started to specialize at age six, 16, 17, then, then they're doing some testing and then they're understanding what are the strengths, what are the areas that can be improved on because of the testing. Um, um, and it's putting them um, in maybe a use of a sports psychologist especially when they get into more international competition. So they have skills in order to deal with, um, you know, every, every athlete reacts differently to, you know, stress. But um, so, you know, it's a nutritionist, it's a sports psychologist, it's, you know, looking at technique. And so they're probably, a biome biomechanist is, 
is videoing and then showing here's, here's how we think of technique and, you know, and a physiologist understanding. Here are the things we can do to improve, yeah, physiology. Um, a, a lot of the, the sports you mentioned, um, primarily skiing, are, are uh, individual sports. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on Norwegian uh, uh, history in, in team winter sports, uh, bobsled, ice hockey, um, and why you haven't, it, considering this model, why you haven't seen the um, same success. <laughs> um, you know, the Norwegian women's soccer team is always, you know, a threat at the World Cup. Um, other winter sports, hockey, um, I don't, I, I would have to go back and research and wondering if they made, you know, the cut to make it to the last Olympics. Because um, it's really the Central European, you know, and Canada and U.S. that are with hockey. Um, I don't know. There's, <laughs> I, I have my personal opinion, and I just think um, the, there, the individual, it's something about <laughs> that individual doing the best. And they have a team around them, of course, that helps them, a support team. But... Um, yeah, that's a fascinating, that, that's a great question, because I, I don't have a great answer for that. I think someone in the back does, though. <laughs> uh, my question, well, first, um, a plug. If um, folks want to try biathlon, um, the Washington Biathlon Association is running several events this winter for kids and adults. And my question is, um, I, I wasn't totally clear on the connection of mythology and how that is contributing to the... Uh, winter sport excellence, and then I wondered if the population of Norway is somewhat similar to Oregon, like what does that tell you about um, what it takes to win? Is it the wraparound culture or is it the um, additional tremendous resources that are put into this? Like could America, what can America learn? So maybe I should have gone into maybe more detail if you, some of the Norwegian mythology, some of it's R-rated. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty gruesome. I mean, some of the murders and some of the things that happen, but I was trying to emphasize that it's a cultural thing that, you know, that they have Norwegian gods and goddesses, Norwegian giants and giantesses that they, you know, that had this resurgent, resurgence. And so it was really, um, it speaks to their, their past and that, you know, it, it, it is who they are. It is of national importance to do well, right? And so um, I think the mythology is just, one part of that, along with, you know, sport, the skiing became a sport, you know, and, and the whole Idrit and free loose live. So it's, it's not as though Norwegian mythology is driving winter sport now. It's just, it's their cultural makeup. Um, even though it's 150, maybe, you know, almost over 100 years old, that, that resurgence of Norwegian mythology. But I, I find it interesting um, um, if, if you're a cross-country skier, you know the name Bill Koch. He won a, a first Olympic medal in cross-country skiing in 1976. And so about 20 years ago, we were talking about Norway, and he goes, Tim, and I had gone to Norway several times, winter and summer, and he goes, this is how I think of it, Tim. Wrap all our professional sports, NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, and wrap them all to one, and that's how how important winter sport is to Norway. And, and so as an American, you can understand the professional sport, but what, yeah. Friends of mine would, on Saturday and Sunday, you have a, a great breakfast, you go out and ski, and then you come home and you watch the World Cup on TV. And you watch your countrymen, men and women, um, compete in different sp winter sports. Um, you know, Sunday, they may go to church, and then they ski, and then they watch the World Cup. But yeah, it's very important to them. Um, just regarding the, the team sports thing, uh, well, first of all, with cross-country skiing and other things, there's never a sport too small to excel at. So that's one thing, you know. <laughs> it helps to, uh, helps to have been early when you, uh, in the development of the Olympic movement for winter sports. But, this is purely my theory, 
but when the glaciers retracted from Norway, they went and Norway lifted out. So Norway is much more mountainous. It's got fjords, it's got valleys. Sweden and Finland are much more uh, filled with lakes. So lakes freeze, you can skate on them. Rivers, not so much. Um, <laughs> in the 50s, Sweden's built a lot of ice hockey rinks and they spent a lot of money on ice hockey, which is why they were good. It happens to be that all those ice hockey rinks had basements where they played table tennis, and they're also very good at table tennis. Um, <laughs> so there, there's things like that that happen, but also Norwegians are individuals. They're individualistic, and they live in valleys. And, yeah. you know, that's sort of what has driven a lot of that. Uh, it's sort of geographical, cultural uh, that drives some of those. Uh, a question I have to ask as a cross-country skier, uh, you've described something that is in Norway is the other end of the extreme from Oregon in terms of the passion for it. I don't see the, uh, you know, what lessons can we take that we can implement to try and improve the winter sports in Oregon? So I, I would start with children. It's all about fun, friendship, and developing good skills. And um, yeah, I have great passion for skiing. And people try to label me. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm a skier. I alpine ski in, in, in the spring, because at Mount Bachelor it's really fun. But I skied this morning. I, I skated for about an hour on trails near, near Bend at Meisner Snow Park. So, I think it's the same for adults. It's got to be fun. But you, you see how many cultural things are kind of at play. You know, there are only 1.3 million more than Oregon. But, um, yeah, w w I, I, I grieve for the youth sports in our country. There are fantastic coaches. There are fantastic programs. But when it's unregulated and it's for profit, you have problems. And I would, uh, I would try to, it, 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 right now it'd be very extremely difficult to change, but it, there needs to be change in the US. That, that's my opinion. Um, I had the opportunity to, um, to talk to some kids at the, uh, at the US Junior Nationals uh, for cross country skiing and the, part of the discussion was is that those athletes were going to do an exchange program with Nor Norwegian coaches. Um, which, what, which uh, what year? Oh, this would have been um, a num number of years ago. I don't, I don't okay. remember. Um, so my question is, what are they going to learn? What, what's different between the US and the Norwegian programs that would cause American youth to want to train under Norwegian coaches? Um, first of all, that you understand that Norwegians are human and that you can be skiing with them and, and training and competing with them. And that's the first thing. You, you have to believe that you can do that. And so part of it is just there are a number of programs that take kids over 16, 17-year-olds um, to race. It's called the, uh, it's called the U18. This, this used to be called the Scandinavian, Scandinavian Cup, Scando Cup. Um, just so they get experience, they're like, oh, I'm 16 and 17 just like they are, and I'm competing with them. And I'm not at the end of the, I'm not at the last page of the results. I'm head to head. So some of that is, some of that is very important to do, that you, you, you believe that you can do it. Um, if your race, if, you're, if, if performance is very important to you, a high level of performance. Yeah. Did that answer your, they, no? of their success so with 
with the internet and with YouTube videos, they're not doing any secrets. But understand what kids get in Norway versus the US. So if more is better, that's what sometimes American sport parents think about. And it's like, no, more multi-sport participation and more fun and more friendship is what is needed up until the time of sports specialization. So um, yeah, that is driven home a lot in Norway. Yeah. I had the pleasure of skiing with um, Ted Scheinman in Norway twice. And one of the huts we stayed in, there was a group of kids, a class, and they all skied. I, don't, I would guess they were about fifth graders, you know, about 11 year old, 10, 11 year old. And the kids on the sea all get for a week in the mountains skiing, and kids in the mountains get this to go to the ocean. But, but every, you think of every kid class in Portland and all the metro area of major parts in Oregon were going to the mountains for a week skiing with their friends every year or at least a couple times in their life. I mean, we don't have the kids, the opportunity for our kids to get up on the snow the way they do. Yeah, um, in Bend they used to have a program that you would have skiing a week for sixth graders. Every sixth grade in Bend Lapine School District would ski five days. That program is no longer going on. There's a different mentality at the corporate level at Mount Bachelor. But that basically it was basically everything was free for those kids. So that all the rentals if, if they weren't a skier already. And I thought it was a great introduction for future customers, but yeah. It they did both cross country and alpine. So they, they, the kids got this great experience. I've been in Finland in the winter, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where the school children in the grade schools had skiing lessons every day as part of the curriculum. They just skied out the door at the school. <laughs> they didn't have to go anywhere, it was right there. But it was part of the curriculum just like yeah. arithmetic and uh, language and everything else. Other questions? Have I missed anybody? Any last remarks that you want to share with the group? Words no, of I've, wisdom? <laughs> um, no, I've talked myself <laughs> out, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Tim. This was a great presentation.